Hello, folks, and welcome to today's expert webinar presented by Accountants World. My name is Div Bensali. I'm a vice president at Accountants World. We'll be joined today by Joel Sinkin, president of Transition Advisors. He'll be speaking on succession planning and alternative deal structures. We're going to get started in about five minutes here, four or five minutes here. Uh, just a reminder, if you have not yet downloaded Joel's presentation handout, you can go to the handout tab on your GoToWebinar control panel, and you'll see a PDF file in there. You can go ahead and download that. Thanks again for joining us today, and we'll be getting started in just about four minutes. Accountants World and alternative deal structures. And our speaker is Joel Sinkin, president of Transition Advisors LLC. Presentation. Uh, Joel has presented for us before, and uh, the feedback has always been really fantastic uh, from accountants who join us. So we're looking forward to another great presentation today. Before we get started with Joel, just a couple of tips about using the GoToWebinar tool in case you haven't done so in a while. Um, if you don't see the GoToWebinar control panel, look for a little orange arrow, and that arrow will allow you to expand or hide the panel at any time. If you'd like to see your two audio options, you can click on the audio section. That'll open up, and then you can choose either to listen via telephone or computer speakers. If you choose phone call, you'll see the dial-in number and access code to be able to access the uh, recording today, or excuse me, the presentation today. If you haven't downloaded Joel's handout yet, it's available as a PDF under the handouts tab. So you can open that up, find the PDF in there. Sometimes we have a lot of folks who are trying to download it at once right at the beginning of the presentation. Um, so if it doesn't work the first time, uh, please bear with us and, and try again in a few minutes and hopefully it works then. If you don't get the presentation, uh, just email us after the webinar today at marketing at accountantsworld.com and we'll be sure to get you a copy. And finally, if you have any questions during the presentation, um, Joel will be responding to questions at the end of the presentation so that most of the questions you would have, you can probably cover in the course of these 45, 50 minutes. Um, but if there's anything that you'd like to ask that he does not cover, go ahead and submit it at any time and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation today. Also wanted to uh, remind everybody, um, my colleague Tom will be live tweeting about today's webinar. Uh, so if you're on Twitter, you can look for the hashtag expert webinar. You're going to see that on the bottom left of our slides here. Um, and you can use that hashtag to see what Tom is talking about, as well as to add your own tweets as well. We'd love for you to participate and join with us from there. We do offer one CP for this webinar today, and that's based on active participation during the live presentation. Um, and active participation means three things. Um, it means attending the live webinar for no less than 50 minutes, responding to all three of the polling questions today, and then submitting the post-webinar survey within 24 hours after the webinar has ended. You should see that post-webinar survey launch as soon as you close out of the webinar window at the end of today's webinar. If you don't see it, don't worry about it. We'll send you a link to that survey by email afterwards as well. 
uh, and you can fill it out that way. You'll receive your CP by email within three business days, uh, and it'll be coming from webinar at accountantsworld.com. So one of the things that we encourage people to do whenever we have people email us and say, hey, I didn't get my CP certificate, 90% of the time, the issue is that you haven't whitelisted the webinar at accountantsworld.com email address, and so it's ending up in your spam folder or your junk folder. Um, so what I'd encourage all of you to do is uh, go to your mail program and add webinar at accountantsworld.com to your trusted email list. That'll ensure that the CP is delivered. If you don't get it by early part of next week, go ahead and uh, shoot us an email and we'll look into it. A brief word about our sponsor today. Accountants World is a leading provider of cloud-based solutions for accountants. And our solutions are defined as being accountant-centric, which means that they've been designed specifically for the needs of professional accountants uh, and the crucial role that accountants play in core business services, especially accounting and payroll. Our solutions are sold exclusively to professional accountants like you, and they're designed to help you revamp your accounting and payroll practices to make them more profitable, add more value to your clients' businesses, and serve your clients the best way possible. So if you'd like to learn more about Accountants World, you can visit our new website at www.accountantsworld.com. Even if you've been there before but haven't seen the new website, we encourage you to go ahead and take a look, and we'd love to hear what you have to say about it. Um, and we offer uh, a weekly webinar as well that you may be interested in, which is about profitable payroll. So if you're offering payroll right now, uh, payroll services to your clients, uh, or you're considering offering payroll services and aren't sure where to get started, payroll is often thought of, and, and for many accountants, it is a low profit margin service. And payroll relief is designed to transform that on its head and turn it into one of the highest margin services that you offer. And the key to that is the level of automation that's included in payroll relief. With payroll relief, you'll be able to automate your payroll processing, including direct deposits, tax payments, and the filing of tax forms. Payroll relief handles all of that automatically on time and with 100% guaranteed accuracy. You can earn, consistently earn three to $5 or more per paycheck. If you'd like to learn more, the best way to get started is to attend a free payroll webinar by going to improveyourpayroll.com. So that's the words improveyourpayroll, all one phrase, dot com. Before I turn it over to our presenter today, a brief word about Joel Sinken. Joel Sinken is the president of Transition Advisors LLC, a firm that exclusively consults on growth and succession strategies using mergers and acquisitions for CPA firms. Joel is an expert in practice evaluation, succession planning, and transaction structure. He consults on both internal and external succession planning and provides complete support throughout the transaction to his client firms. He's consistently been named one of the top 100 most influential people in accounting by Accounting Today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Joel in just a moment, but before I do, I'll actually go ahead and launch our first poll question here. And so attendees should be seeing the poll question open in front of them. And that poll question says, how many equity partners do you have in your firm? And so you see the choices there, one, two to four, five to nine, or 10 to 19, or 20 or more. So uh, if you could go ahead and please submit the answer that corresponds to your firm. Make sure to click the submit button so that your vote is counted. And uh, once we've got everyone's votes in, I'll go ahead and close the poll. We'll take about 10 more seconds here for people to go ahead and submit their poll. And just a reminder, voting in this and questions two and three is required in order to earn CP credit today. So if you have not submitted your uh, poll question yet, going once, going twice, and we'll go ahead and close it out. Um, and so, uh, Joel, what we see here is 58% of uh, attendees today are in one partner firms, 34% two to four partner, and then 8% uh, are five or larger. And so with that, Joel, I'll go ahead and uh, get this over to you.
not asking me to show my screen. Uh, let's see. So it's saying on my side, waiting to view Joel Sinkin's screen. There we go. Okay, it just took a moment for it to catch up. Okay, welcome everybody. And uh, for those of you who've heard me speak before, welcome back to Elm Street. I'm still Freddie. And today we're going to focus on succession planning, which will include when to start the process, how to choose a successor, and the alternative deal structures available. Based on our initial polling question, we'll focus more on the smaller firms, but try and bring value to everybody who's there attending today. The, uh, I never like to make a CPE class an info commercial and won't, but I do think it's important to have the perspective of the speaker. Uh, for the last 27 years, this is all I've done, M&A of accounting firms and adding partners, et cetera, and for been involved in over 850 closings of accounting firms. So the good part about hearing us talk today is we've made tons of mistakes. We try not to make the same mistake twice. So the more mistakes you make, the smarter you get. So hopefully you'll get more value out of hearing from me today than you would have 27 years ago. The uh, One of the things that kind of frustrates people sometimes is that the uniqueness of each accounting firm is such that there's no rules that I'm going to be able to give you today. If there's 50 things you need to know about succession planning and alternative deal structures, the smartest person in the room is going to think of 35. I'm hopefully going to get you to the 40s today, but the uniqueness of each practice. I could take two firms doing the same revenue with the same amount of partners and same amount of staff, and that might be the only things that are same in their firm. But there are guiding principles and parameters that we try and stay within, and those are the ones we're going to focus on and share with you today. You know, if you're readers of Accounting Today, Journal of Accountancy, I read because I write for them all the time. There's not a publication that doesn't talk about some sort of M&A activity, you know, buying, selling, merging of firms. So why is the activity so high right now? Well, if you look at certain historical things, in 2006 through 2008, the economy was so good that the M&A world was very slow. I mean, if the organic growth was so substantial and the staffing was such sparse that most of the mergers that were done were really to bring in more talent. Then 2009 and to 2012 came and the economy went south. And as a result of that, organic growth was stymied dramatically. So the way people were looking to grow was much more through mergers and acquisitions. The anticipation of 2018 is that because of the three factors that we're about to go through, that the M&A activity will be geometrically greater than it's ever been before. Um, I, I worked very closely with the AICPA, and Barry Melanson a few years ago said that they expected over the next three years for them to be more mergers and acquisitions in the accounting world than the 10 cumulative years prior. Three of the big driving factors of that include niche development, I mean, if you've seen most of the large firm deals that are being done these days, you see a lot of them are acquiring cybersecurity firms, back office outsourcing firms, litigation support, and all these different niches. There's a lot of reasons for that. Some people fear that the future of between blockchain and AI and big data are going to reduce greatly some of the traditional fees uh, and services we render. Others, are, so they look to supplement them and bring in more consulting services. The big reason for niche development is, of course, selling services. I provided you A through, F, through E, now I could do F through X. So niche development's been a big part of the M&A activity. But without any question about it, the biggest driving force is the aging of the community. Right now, the baby boomers are aging, and we're at a challenging position because statistically, the majority of founding partners are going to be looking to reduce their time commitment over the next several years at a time we have the smallest amount of partner-ready talent to replace them. So here we're having this tremendous exodus in the profession at a time we don't have that, that bench strength that everybody hoped for. Now, IT has also made M&A activities stronger because you could have satellite offices that still create synergies and things like that. So niche development, IT development have been a big impact, but the biggest impact by far is the baby boomer and the aging of the community. A lot of people 
want to read into that. What is one of the questions I get frequently is, is it a buyer or seller's marketplace? Now, for the first 20 plus years I did this, almost across the board, with few exceptions, it was very much a seller's marketplace. When someone said, I've got half a million, a million, $10 million of repetitive revenues and I'm ready to give it up, there was a pretty substantial audience for that. Now, in accounting, you can only grow one client at a time by adding niches to cross sell, or the quickest way is to MA. But because of the supply demand change, because of a lot of the different changes, we're seeing that buyer seller's marketplace shift as well. One of the key factors in determining if it's a buyer or seller's marketplace is location. I'm speaking to you today just on the border of Nassau County, Long Island. I know I sounded like I'm from Georgia, but I was fooling all of you. Um, I'm from New York. And what happens is in Nassau County, Long Island, there are 3,200 CPA firms. So if I've got a half a million dollar practice or a million dollar practice, there are scores of firms that can absorb me with no incremental increases in overhead, which makes it very much still a seller's marketplace. The values have come down dramatically over the last few years, but the demand for the small firm still exists. If I'm in two hours, three hours outside of Boise, Idaho, I might be in some of the most beautiful land we have in the country, but there may be one accountant for every two or three zip codes. So in which case, the sparsity of potential successor firms is so great, it's a buyer's marketplace. Where it's changed the most are in the medium to large size firms. What I mean by that is, you look at a place like Boston. Boston's a pretty big little city. They have approximately 51 firms in the greater metropolitan area of Boston doing three to $10 million in revenues. Statistically, 70% of their, their senior partners are looking to slow down over the next couple of years. There's probably only four or five firms in Boston, other than the nationals, that are big enough to take those firms over. So suddenly, the supply-demand curve is such that as you go up in revenue, the firms larger than you that have the capacity, desire, and everything else to absorb you have changed dramatically. So the larger the firm, in most cases, the smaller the market and the more it's a buyer's marketplace. The more sparsely populated parts of the country, buyer also a marketplace. For the density filled populations, for small firms, it's still very much a seller's marketplace. Now, there's always exceptions, you know, practices that have great niches, practices that have great revenue, practices that have great staff. But generally speaking, these are the trends we're seeing. And while t 20 years ago, you heard about firms going for one and a half to two times, those days are long, long over. But we keep talking about this baby boomer movement. And here's some statistics from the AICPA. Almost two thirds of firm partners are over 50 years old and the founding partners are much older. 80% of multi-owner firms expect succession planning to be their most important issue over the next decade. Almost half the firms finally have a succession plan in place, but yet the smaller firms very rarely, very rarely do. These are, this shows the statistics that the AICPA's 2016 survey showed where the larger the firm, the more likely you're making partner buyouts. Now, under 2 million, it says only 25%, but that's frequently because it's sole practitioners and two partner firms and buyouts aren't taking place. But this is, shows you statistically how overwhelming these issues are and how they are growing uh, geometrically as time goes on. So one of the initial things you need to think about is when you is in succession planning is when do you want to start to plan your succession now before you do that i want you to think about why do you have your clients you know what most of you on the phone are small firms and therefore most of you have clients that are partner level if you're a partner with pwc your clients are probably brand loyal matter of fact they're going there because a bank needed them to or what have you but for Smaller firms, your clients are predominantly partner loyal. 
I'll also say something that I don't mean as uncomfortable as this sounds, but I doubt you have 1% of your clients who know if you're competent or incompetent, because if they knew that much to measure your technical skills, why are they paying you to do the work they understand so completely? You have your clients because of you. You are the most trusted business advisor they have. They, they, it's a blind faith. It's a great, great compliment. So now that we understand that most of our clients we have because of us, we realize that it takes a little longer to transition those clients than it would if they were brand loyal. So let's go back. When should we start the process? Well, the first question I ask someone is, how many more tax seasons do you want to work full time? You see, one of the problems people have when they plan to their transition is they think in terms of black and white. I'm working full time. I retire. Most people end up not doing it that way. Most people end up gradually reducing their time commitment to the firm. So that's why very specifically I'm asking, how many more tax seasons do you want to work full time? Now, Many, many years ago, in 1990, when I started doing M&A of accounting firms, most of the small firms I worked with went out every month a quarter to their clients. Heck, a lot of them did the work there. They took out their check, and the client signed it, and they moved on. Well, welcome to 2018. If you're not on the cloud, you should be. And while we communicate with our clients more than we ever have before between the cloud and portals and faxes and emails and Skype and phone, we never spent less time physically in the same room with our clients. Accounting Today suggested that over 85% of accounting firm clients are only in the same room with their partner that manages them once a year. So if I ask you how many more years you want to work full time before you slow down and you said to me three years, it sounds like an eternity. But three years is only three visits. Five years is five visits. You can't transition part the loyal clients through the cloud or the phone. You have to do it in a more gradual way with face-to-face -face exposure. So it's very important if you've made the decision that you're five years or less from slowing down to start your succession plan now so that you have time to do a proper transition. Now, if you're one of those firms that still sees almost every client in your base monthly or quarterly, you, obviously, it's going to take you less time to do a transition than if you see the lion's share of your clients annually. Now, there are other things that will impact your decisions about when to start the process. For example, leases. Nothing's more frustrating than the type of call I get frequently. For example, just yesterday, I got a call from a firm in Texas, and they said to me, Joel, I'm a $2.5 million firm. I'm looking to merge up. Two of our partners are looking for succession. I'm the young guy, but I don't have the capacity to take them over. He's telling me all these compelling things. And then he says, and we just re-signed our lease. We have a 10-year lease with beautiful, well-appointed space. It's a great market price. It's fabulous. So I said to him, how big are you? He said, two and a half million. I said, how big do you think your success is going to be? He said, probably five to 20 million. I said, don't you think they have an office? What he just did by signing that lease extension was basically lose a large percentage of the audience. So here is his last and most important decision he makes relating to his firm, and a bunch of people will no longer consider it because they don't want a second office. Others will consider it, but they'll ultimately reduce the offer they make to that firm because of the additional costs involved, where if they could have absorbed that practice with little to no incremental increases, they could have afforded to pay a premium and still make more money. So there are many things to decide on the process of starting your transition, of when to start based on the face time you have, how often you see your clients, the nature of the relationship, is it personal, is it partner loyal, is it brand loyal? And sometimes certain investments in technology and leases and staff can change that because why not have the successor firm do that? So this is some of our starting point today. Now you have to sit there and say to yourself, is my successor ready? You know, are they, do they know what they're getting into? So th one of the first questions I ask a firm when they want to merge someone in and be the successor firm is, what's your goal in the merger? Why do you want to do it? A lot of times you hear great reasons. 
well, we have some young talent we want to promote. We've created some capacity with our new technology embracing that we've been undertaking and all these wonderful things. Sometimes you hear silly things. I have a lot of extra space, and I figured if I brought someone in, I could reduce my overhead. A merge is a marriage. We spend more waking time with our partners than our spouse. Uh, overhead reduction is a terrible reason to do a merger. You could sublet someone's space and accomplish that. A merger should be for much better reasons. But why do they want to merge? Do they have the staffing situation to back up and support you? Do they have the excess capacity and skill set to replace the team members of yours, if any, that are retiring? Do they have the space to accommodate it? Are we on a similar technology platform? And do they have the financial strength or, do, or, or weakness to do this? If their suggestion is, we'll hire the staff, well, good luck. I wouldn't want to make a succession plan based on someone identifying more people to come in because that's a challenge in today's marketplace, as we all know. But we also remember something. Bigger is not always better. Better is better. Now, bigger can be better and frequently is because usually you need a firm of, of larger size than your own who has the capacity and usually a bigger platform of services and very helpful to, for doing it. But bigger is not always better. If you're a small firm and you have a bunch of compilation write-up tax clients that you're doing a lot of hand-holding with, is a partner at a big firm going to go out and see that client like you are right now? So you've got to look at different things. So choosing your successor is a very important uh, aspect of proper succession planning. Other things you need to do is make sure that you understand specialties and sometimes licenses. For example, in the state of New Jersey, to do municipal accounting work, you have to be an RMA, a registered municipalities accountant. So sometimes you have to have a special license. Sometimes you're doing a niche. So you want to make sure the successor is capable of that. You want to look at the size of the successor. Just because sometimes size can be a proxy for culture, but you don't want to get too stuck on it, as I mentioned before. But I certainly want to look at their retention rate of the successor firm's retention rate of both their clients and staff. Because if they can't keep their own clients and staff, how are they going to keep mine? Again, do they have the capacity? Billing rates is a very touchy subject, one that I don't think most people get. Now, you have to have similar rates because you're not going to be able to merge into a firm, double everybody's fees, and, and expect good retention. But how you evaluate billing rates are different. So, for example, very recently, we had a two-partner firm in Florida doing $2 million dollars. Uh, that was looking for succession. They had a very unusual practice. They had the two owners and they had 10 glorified paraprofessionals and junior level accountants doing all the work. They had no seniors, no managers. During due diligence, the larger firm called me up at one point in time and said, Joe, we've got a problem. We just realized that the partner's billing rate's only 200 an hour, we get 300 an hour. I said, well, you were just doing your due diligence in your firm, if you absorb this practice, who would be doing most of the work that, that the two owners are doing right now? They said, oh, almost all of it's senior level work. I said, what do you bill your senior out for? They said, 150 an hour. I said, I guess they're getting 200 an hour now. See, they were so busy looking at a piece of paper that said the rates, they never converted how they would handle it. Would they be able to leverage it to lower staff? Is their technology stronger, that it would take less time and effort to develop the fee, in which case the rates wouldn't be as impacted? Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes a smaller firm doesn't have as robust of a quality control, pro control process, so it takes the successor for more time and effort to develop the fees. So the billing rates aren't something that's stated on a piece of paper. It's something that requires some, some investigation. You know, selecting your successors, you know, having the prevention, the, the skill sets needed. Location can be important, not always. For example, if everybody mails in the work to me and everything is done remotely, then the only reason location is important is for staff and partner retention, which is, is important. If all the clients come to the office, then location is very important. But it doesn't mean it has to be the same building but it's very hard to move a practice in a long way. Very recently, we had a, a, an example where there was a firm in the Beltway of D.C., and if anybody's ever experienced the Beltway of D.C. during rush hour, they know that the traffic situation, 20 miles apart, but it was an hour during rush hour, it was an issue for them. 
one of the other things you always want to look at in selecting a successor is the culture. The culture, for example, is are your partners brand loyal or partner loyal? Are we a one firm client concept or are we an eat what you kill firm? So these are some of the things you need to get accustomed to. I would say that culture is a thrown around word that correctly is concerns uh, everybody, that their cultures have to match. But if I was to take a very complicated topic such as culture and all the things that make it up from billing philosophy, staff philosophies, IT has a culture, the best way I can give you in a shortcut to determining someone's culture is looking at it three different ways. One, what's it like to be a partner in the firm? Two, what's it like to be a staff person in the firm? Three, what's it like to be a client in that firm? And how do those three aspects compare to yours? So these are some of the keys in selecting the right quote unquote successor firm. It'd be nice to make sure that they're not robbing from Peter to pay Paul because you don't want to wake up one day being Peter. Again, capacity, staffing, technical skills. Sometimes we're so politically correct, we don't think about ethnicity and language considerations. I had a firm in, in the story of Queens, New York. If you didn't speak Greek, you couldn't buy the practice. It's just the way it is. I had a practice on the, on, in California that was owned by three women that if you weren't a women-owned firm, they wouldn't sell it to you because their whole marketing program was a woman-owned accounting firm helping women-owned businesses. So sometimes you gotta, can't be politically correct. You have to be realistic of how choosing a successor is. One of the minor things, but it's worth note, is also when you're talking to a potential successor firm, how long have their partners been together? If they all just got together, it's hard to be as confident that they'll be a, 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 a well-oiled machine for the next 10 years. Sometimes new firms have some bumps and grinds that they have to go through and, and everything else. You know, sometimes you don't want to be part of that risk at the beginning. And if I'm promoting a staff person to be a, my, my successor, their track record should tell you everything. Remember, being your successor isn't just about loyalty to someone who's, who's had a long tenure with you. They have to have the ability to replace you. And that track record has to show that they have that ability. Uh, let's get another polling question in so you can get credits for having to listen to my New York nasally sound. All right, sounds good. So we'll go ahead and launch the second poll question right now. And folks, you should see it come up in just a second here. Uh, so the question is, how many more tax seasons do you envision yourself working full time? One to three, four to six, more than six, or until I die at my desk, which I guess actually is sort of, uh, it could be one of those other ones, I'm sorry to say, but uh, go ahead and pick one of those and, uh, and click the submit button. Submit button is on the bottom under the four options. Um, and a reminder that this is the second of the three polling questions today and voting in all three of the poll questions is required in order to get CP. Um, so I see most of you have gone ahead and voted at this point. We'll take about three or four more minutes here, or three or four more seconds here for any last takers. Going once, going twice, and sold. Okay, so Joel, a pretty even split here. 37% said more than six, but uh, 24 and 22% said one to three, uh, or four to six, a pretty pretty evenly split there. So we have a bunch of firms that are interested in being the successor, appropriately so. It's a great way to grow, and a bunch of firms that are on the other side. If you're one to three, I really want to encourage you to have a sense of urgency to make that step. I know it's uncomfortable, but we're going to give you some reasons and that, that will make it l less uh, uncomfortable for you. If you're four to six, it's time to start planning. If you're greater than that, You've, you've got some time unless there's some mitigating circumstances. But let's talk now about the methods of structuring the transition of a practice. So how do you do these types of things? So there are five main types of deal structures. There are additional ones, but 95 or more percent of the deals I've been involved in, and I touch about 40, 50 deals a year between consulting and, and otherwise, uh, most of them will fit into this category. The first one we'll call a straight sale. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm selling my practice and going to Boca Raton tomorrow. It means I'm no longer, I'm not looking to be a partner in the successor firm. I'm not looking to work full time. 
hopefully I am going to still be available to do a proper transition. So that's a straight sale. Believe it or not, it's not that frequent of a deal structure for us. Uh, I'd say it's probably the third most frequent one, approximately. But it's a, it's a viable plan. You know, it, it goes to how much time it takes to do a transition, which we'll talk about later. You know, in a perfect world, I'd rather someone invested more time into the into the transition and and spent had a longer period of time of working together before they slowed down. But whether it be for personal reasons, for health reasons, or just burnout reasons, a straight sale does happen occasionally. The least often deal is a buy-in to a buy-out. An example of that might be I'm a I'm a eight hundred thousand dollar practitioner. You're a two hundred thousand dollar practitioner. The new firm when we get together is a million dollars. For you to be a fifty percent equity partner, you needed five hundred thousand. You only came in with two. So you initially you acquire three hundred thousand from me, and then later buy out the balance. A buy in to a buy out. We're doing that right now with a six and a half million dollar firm and a million and a half dollar firm, where the million and a half dollar firm is actually going into the larger firm to help with their succession planning and building their bench strength through a buy in to a buy out. Sometimes the, success, the seller says, look, you could buy in an equity interest into my practice, but I don't want to buy one. I don't want you to become a partner with me because of the liability and exposure. So some t most of the time people will use their practice as a tool to adjust in the example I gave of the 800-200. Other times they'll just say, look, you could buy in a, an equity interest into my firm, but keep your firm separate. A merger to buy out is probably the second most frequent type of deal we do. Let's use a simple example. I'm a, I'm a million dollar firm, uh, Div is four million, the new firm's $5 million. I came in with a million, so I'm a 20% equity partner. And maybe down the road, I, I'll, be, I, I'll, I'll, get, I'll buy out or be bought out, depending on who's dancing with who at that point in time. So a merger to buy out is very similar to a buy-in to a buy out, except there's not an initial acquisition. It's a merger that leads to it. Now, what's really important with that is you don't do the merger to, with the goal of a buy out unless you've already worked out what that buyout looks like. Even if it's five, 10 years away, what you don't wanna do is have a merger, have everything go great, then five years later, it's time to work out the buyout and you can't agree on it. it makes no sense. So make sure in any type of merger that leads to a buyout, you've come to all the important conclusions you have to come to. For example, in the merger aspect of it, you have to figure out governance and voting, you have to figure out compensation, capital, the capital required, dealing with exposure, AR, WIP, what the buyouts will be, a merge is a marriage. There's a lot to go into it. None of it's brain surgery. But, you know, are we going to have a cap that prevents us from paying more than X percentage of our revenues to retired partners? Is there a vesting period? And, of course, there has to be a buyout formula. One of the more unusual types of deal structures that we're starting to see happen more often, which might be coincidence, but it doesn't appear to be, is what I call a carve-out or a culling out of a, of a practice. I'll give you a couple quick examples of that. Very recently, we had a firm that got very involved in litigation support and decided that they no longer wanted to deal with the traditional compliance side of their practice. So they signed a non-compete in the traditional accounting and tax work. The buyer signed a non-compete as it related to litigation support. And the gentleman sold his litigation support practice to this firm and culled out a niche that they retained. I've seen people cull out the niche to retain it. I've seen people cull out the niche to sell it. I'm working with a firm right now that actually is separating their audit from their write-up. Because their audit is, the write-up work is kind of a lower fee type of service that the firms big enough to do the audit wouldn't want the write-up stuff. So it's very unusual to find two different buyers for the same practice. Probably only the fourth time I've done it in over a decade. But it is another viable thing that people have to do. So another example of a call-out sale, though, is one that we're working on right now in, in the uh, West Coast where it's a firm doing about 1.6 million, two owners. 
one owner has decided that there's about $200,000 worth of clients. They're not the best paying. They're actually probably some of the weaker paying, but they're the oldest clients he's had. He's, uh, she's had, excuse me. She's very loyal to them, and she doesn't want to trans transition them. So she's culling them out to retain them. So she's selling the clients on Exhibit A of the contract I'm preparing, but retaining the clients on Exhibit B without it being considered a violation of the non-compete. We're even giving the buyer the first right of refusal to take that. Another cull-out sale. And the third type of cull-out sale I can tell you about is almost a cutting off the limb before it poisons the rest of the body. There was a firm in the Chicago area I did a retreat for about five years ago. They're doing about six million, and almost all their equity owners were over 60 years old. During the retreat, we came to the, I came to the conclusion and advised them that they needed to do an upstream merger to impact and to settle out their succession. They were very, very much against it. They said, we're never going to do that. We're never going to give up control. We're never going to want to merge up. And I've heard it before, but they were vehement about it, in my opinion, inappropriately. But they said they're going to develop the talent and bring it in externally. Five years later brings us to a couple of months ago when they called me up. And they said they've been very unsuccessful. They were able to bring in two young people, but they still have five partners that have to be, that want to go. And can I help them out and find them talent? I said, it's a needle in a haystack finding young talent to, to build, add to your succession team. You really need to do an upstream merger. They said they wouldn't, but they were desperate to figure something out. What we decided was we took a million dollars of their lowest paying fees. It's the old rule. The clients that pay you the least take up a significant disproportionate amount of their time. By taking that million dollar firm and of their clients and culling it out, what we did was we created so much more capacity in the firm that we were able to effect a transition of three of the partners and still to work on two more down the road. So we took clients that we were probably barely making money on and we sold them. We, got, we didn't get a big package, but we got 15% of collections for seven years from a firm who coveted them. Remember, a large firm's basement clients frequently are a smaller firm's ceiling clients. So they were very excited to do it. And we met, said to, our client, to the clients of the fir large firm that sold that million-dollar portion, we said to those clients, look, we're we either going to have to give you a fee increase or because our large firm has a bigger quality control process and all sorts of language we added, we said, or you can st go to the firm that we have a joint relationship with that will be able to keep the fee the same. Whatever happened, we couldn't lose. It worked out that over 90% of them went to the successor firm. Some of them stayed under getting a large fee increase, and some of them left, which was good riddance, sadly to say. So that's another type of sale, a cull-out sale. But by far and away, the deal that we do the most is a two-stage deal. A two-stage deal is designed for someone five years or less from slowing down who wants to maintain reasonable autonomy and control and income but at the same time affect a gradual transition plan. Think of it in this way. You have stage one, which we're going to look at like the merger period. Stage two is the buyout period. So the way we start with stage one is we sit there and we take the owner we figure out what are they netting right now. So let's use an example of a small firm since it's easy to focus. Let's say it's a half million dollar firm and the seller's netting 40%. Then we calculate how much labor the owner used to achieve that net. Now, if we were talking about a four or $5 million dollar firm, we'd focus more on the partner's chargeable hours. But for this purpose of a sole practitioner, we're gonna focus on the labor support they use. So what we would say is exhibit A of the contracts, their client list, that, that the seller is making 35%, 40% of what came in from those people using exhibit B that much labor. So then we say, how many more years do you want to stay full time to, to miss seller or miss the seller? Let's say they said three years. Okay, this playing field has been established. Half million dollar client base, net 40%. Let's say it's being operated with one senior, one junior, and a per diem and, and uh, they want to work three more years. The successor at that point in time takes over all of the costs of operation, the labor, the rent, they take on everything. As money comes in, the seller is paid to their entity 
a percentage of the gross for collections. In this case, we said they were making 40%. We keep paying them 40%. The tax advantages by paying the seller's entity is one of the complaints you get when someone's looking to give up, sell their practices. They like the opportunity to run what they do through the business. The business is paying their car lease and their medical insurance and feeding retirement plans and all sorts of stuff. This enables the seller to continue to have all those advantages because we're usually paying them on a consulting basis to their entity. And we're not telling the seller when they have to come in and, and leave. What we say to the seller is, look, as you've got to do what it takes to manage the practice. There's only two ways to the seller that they'd make less money. One is if they suddenly needed more staff than they used in the past. But if they didn't do this deal, and needed more labor, they'd have to pay for it. So that wasn't a penalty, that's just reality. The other way they'd make less money is if some of their clients were lost. But this actually mitigates that because, for example, this one firm, let's say their largest client was a $50,000 a year client. If they lost that client and didn't do a deal, they'd lose 50,000. Their gross and net would be the same loss because they couldn't fire anybody, their software is the same, their rent's the same. Now it's only 40%. So from a seller's perspective, they get a lot of reasonable autonomy control. They come and go as they see fit. They're being kept whole in income. They're still running it through their business. But they, uh, and they kind of have downside protection if some of the client fees are lost. For the seller, it's almost like a practice continuation agreement on steroids. You know, plus, in addition to that, usually the successor firm will take over a lot of the administration the billings, the collections, things of that nature, which usually enables the seller to have more free time, which they devote to transition, developing new clients to bring in, which they get compensation for, or just having a higher quality of life. They also have a lot more backup and support. And ultimately, when they get to the sale of the practice, because retention was so great, uh, because the transition was so great, excuse me, the retention's better. One might say it's so one-sided. Why would the buyer do the deal? Well, let's take an example. If the buyer was able to relocate that $500,000 practice into theirs and didn't need the per diem or the clerical, they might be saving $100,000 a year in rent and labor and software and other types of things. They'll get that benefit. Now, I remember last year in a large firm that part of the partners were getting a two-stage deal. When they counted up all the synergies that were created, they said, I want some of that. And I kind of bluntly said that you're not entitled to any of that. Remember, as a seller, what we're saying to you is we're going to be able to keep you whole in income, keep you with reasonable autonomy, control, creating this great transition plan. The fact that the successors were making some money in overhead reduction is good. Why would they do a deal if they get no reward for it? Plus, they're taking on the liability and exposure and usually have to be involved in the administration. It's good that everybody wins. That's what you want to see. Now, Stage two begins, uh, obviously, when stage one ends, which is the buyout. So in the example we suggested was three years that this gentleman was going to work. So usually in the contract, we'll say at the first of the following events, at the end of year three, at a time the seller reduces his time commitment below a certain level, or God forbid death or, or a disability, we go to stage two. Stage two is the buyout. That's if there's a retention period, which there is in most of these deals. That's when the retention begins. That's when the payout begins. This confuses a lot of people. Technically, I've sold my practice day one. I'm not getting paid for years. Well, I can't keep you whole in income and pay you for your equity at the same time. By deferring one for the other, you get a maximum valuation for your time and a maximum valuation for your practice. If you try and get paid for them both at the same time, unless the buyer is prepared to lose money and be in negative cash flow, you're going to get paid less than your time is worth and less than your practice is worth. Usually the seller will be also stay on in a part-time continuing role, which will usually pay them a third of what they're billed out for because we're not having a seller come back in to do uh, write-up work and bank recs. They're usually coming back in doing highest level function, which a third of what they're billed out for is usually a pretty good com uh, compensation. There's other formulas, but that's the most frequent one. And they usually will give them a new business incentive program. If they continue to develop new business, they'll get paid for it. Now, each deal has nuances. Maybe we'll, we'll allow you any new business you bring in in the first year to go to your purchase price in, or in stage one. Maybe we'll allow certain stage one clients to off, new clients you bring in to offset laws. Maybe it will be a new business incentive program from day one. 
but usually it's at a lower value than the rest of the, the purchase price. Because you can't compare a client you just picked up at the Rotary Club last night with a client that you've had for 20 years in value. There's value to it, and you should be compensated for your rainmaking skills. But then, of course, you should also get a buyout with a multiple and a payout period during stage two. I doubt we'll have time today. It's another whole topic. I've written a lot about it. You can see articles on our website on it. But if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about what that multiple is. But now that we've gone through these alternative deal structures, remember that for you, for some of you on the phone today who are multi-partner firms, let's take an example of how you might deal with it. Let's say you have a, a, a three-partner firm. One partner was looking for a quick role reduction. Well, they would get a straight sale. Another partner was working to slow down gradually over the next three years. They would get a two-stage deal. The third partner is only 50 years old but doesn't have the, the capacity to replace the other two. They would get a merger. See, once you understand these alternative deal structures, if you're a multi-partner firm, everybody doesn't have to be in the same place at the same time. You could customize the deal based on what the goals are of the partners, some looking for growth, some for short-term, some for long-term succession. So it's a great strength in understanding these different uh, methods of, of structuring the deal. Now, the partners looking to stay on, they're going to have to figure out what does equity mean? Are there retention elements that adjust the equity? How does comp work? How do, how's their buyout? You know, is there AR whip? All those things I mentioned before, which is another whole CPE class on you know, aspects of the why, when, how, and to merge. But these multiple different types of deal structures help firms that have multiple partners in different places in their career. Now, one of the great obstacles that we run into in succession planning are going to be different roadblocks. This specific roadblock I'm referring to now is in, in getting your deal done. And it's time. We've heard for many, many years the proverb that time kills all deals. But we've never really heard when or how. Let me tell you what my experience has been of why time kills all deals. First of all, if I'm the buyer and you're the seller, in a way, we're in an adversarial position. I'm looking to pay you as little as possible. You're looking to get paid as much as possible. The longer you negotiate, the more likely that it will become some level of adversarial nature to it. The biggest issue for us is the message delaying uh, sense. I'll give you a great example. Last year in the, uh, in the, in, in the South, in the southeast part of the country, in Atlanta, I think it was. There was a $7 million firm we were helping merge into a top 100 firm. And the $7 million firm called me up at the very late latter part of September, early part of October, and said, look, could you ask the larger firm to send me their employee handbook? I just want to take a look to see where there may be discrepancies, things that we could work out. I'm confident we will, but just want to do homework. A very lucid point. I called the managing partner of this several hundred million dollar firm and I asked for the handbook and he said, you know, we're, we just finished the 15th. We, we, we got to get everything done for the October 15th deadline. Then I'm going away for a week. I'll get it to you uh, before Halloween. I said to him, I, I said, Dave, let me ask you a question. Do you have any clients that pay you a couple hundred grand a year? He goes, you know, I do. I said, so if they called you for something sitting on your secretary's computer, and asked you to email it to him. You'd say it's going to take three weeks? And he yelled at me. He goes, that is not fair. These are people that put revenue in our pocket. I said, let me tell you, Dave, the seller's $7.5 million. They're potentially your largest client. And there's only two messages you're sending to them. One message, it's one of two. Either you're so damn busy, how are you going to handle another $7.5 million? Or this deal isn't a priority to you. You see, what people don't think enough about or the emotional aspects of M&A, especially for firms seeking succession. Retirement equals death. I've been master of my own domain for years. I don't want to give up control. There's so many emotional aspects that I have great, great, great respect for. You don't want to feed them in a negative way. This is the last and most important decision on that firm's desk who's merging up or selling. If they're not treated that way, it sends a horrible message. Also, Things tend to leak after a period of time to staff, to clients. 
one of the things I always say is don't keep reading the same contract forever and ever, ever. The 13th time you read it, it suddenly says something different. But the longer you are in dialogue, the more likely someone's going to step in and take that deal away from you. Other roadblocks that we run into is unity of partners. Sometimes you have the managing partner saying, this is what I want to do. But then they sit down to vote when we've worked out all the terms and then they're not on agreement. Make sure that whether you're looking for succession or growth, when you enter the marketplace, you have a unity of partners on what the goals are, what success looks like. Um, you know, capacity is an issue. I keep bringing it up. If they don't have the capacity to replace you or the skill set, that's a major roadblock. Being impatient and not being comfortable with the fact that the emotional side of it could be tough. How staff and clients are going to be treated. By the way, IT can be a roadblock. There was a firm recently that said to me that they were they're looking for a 10 to $20 million firm in New England, but they had to be embraced the cloud. Uh, they had to have embraced technology. And I said, is that because it's going to cost you 10 to 15000 a head to move them to your platform? He said, no, it's because it took me 10 years to get my, my staff and partners to throw out the paper, to go to the portals. I'm not going to take a step backwards. So having a different IT platform, not so much different company, but different levels could be very challenging and could be a roadblock that has to come uh, be dealt with. Equity could be a big roadblock too. Uh, in Philadelphia, we spoke to a firm a couple of weeks ago doing two million. You had the two founding partners that each owned 45% and they gave a partner 10%. Well, that person's 10% of two million. The firm's big enough to take over that $2 million firm are never gonna make someone who was a 10% equity owner based on tenure, a partner in their firm. So equity can get in the way. The name of the firm can get in the way. It's usually so less important than people want to make it out. Unneeded must-haves. You know, a must-have that, hey, I signed this lease personally. I, I'm not going to walk away from it. You have to help me. That's a realistic must-have. Unneeded must-have is you have to keep every one of my staff for the next 25 years. So you've got to be careful about these types of roadblocks. Different cultures could be big roadblocks. Very hard to mix and eat what you kill firm with a one firm client mentality. A firm that does all retainers or fixed fees with a, one that does all time and billing. Certain cultures just don't match really well. There are some things you could do to make your firm more attractive. You know, embracing technology, trying to get certain clients more brand loyal than partner loyal by having them interact with other people than just the main partner. Training your clients that they get your information, your compensation in an appropriate manner. Having an accurate understanding of your firm and its metrics is really important when you go into a merger conversation. So many small firms have impeccable records of their clients, but don't really have a grasp of what they're doing, what they're netting, what their rates are, what their realization is. Understanding these things can be very important to save you time. Maybe your realization or your hourly or whatever is less than someone would have accepted. Well, you should know that before you start the process. And having realistic terms. Nobody's going to do a deal with you to lose money. So they have to sit there and say, what does it cost? How much am I saving by this owner no longer getting paid? Subtract from that, how much is the cost of replacing their labor? Subtract from that the purchase price. What's left has to be a positive number. Well, why would I do the deal? We don't tell our clients to do a deal to lose money. We shouldn't tell each other to do a deal to lose money. One of the most important and where we go to finish this conversation off is, to me, the greatest measure of success of any deal, and that's client retention. You know, the 13th Amendment prevents slavery. You can't buy and sell people. So you have to have a proper transition, which, by the way, is why I'm such a big advocate of the two-stage deal, so you have a proper transition. But if you're going to plan a proper transition, you want to start by understanding the four main fears that clients have when they hear about a merger. First one is, is the partner or owner I trust still there? Are they still running my, my client, me as a client? The second concern is usually, is this going to cost me more money? For some people who come to the accounting firm's office, they're concerned about geographics. Is it still geographically sensitively located? And for many of us, we may have a partner we work with, but there's staff that do a lot of the work with us. Are they going to be part of our new successor firm? So these are some of the concerns. What you want to do 
is you want to overcome these objections before they even start. You've got to remember, to most people, change is a dirty word. We want to not make the emphasis on the loss of anything, but the gain. On We want to not talk about things a negative way. We want to talk about continuity and, and positive things. So there's ways that you do it. The message you send, for example, include the age of specialization. But let's start, not necessarily in the order of this slide, but let's start at the end of it and then come back. We'll start with an example of an announcement letter. Now, everybody doesn't get an announcement letter. I don't send an announcement letter out to my biggest client. I'm just using it as an example. Let's take that very first paragraph. What I would do is use that first paragraph of the announcement letter to overcome those four fears. So if I was the seller, I'd break my clients down into industries or professions, wholesale, retail, doctors. Let's say this announcement letter is going to the doctors. I'd say something like, I'm pleased to announce that I've merged my firm with Jane Doe. Jane's an expert as it relates to the medical profession and the new Trump tax laws. So together, we'll be able to provide you additional services, yet maintain the same fee structure. We remain geographically sensitively located here in Long Island, New York. We're op as I mentioned, we're operating in the same fee structure. I'm still the principal in charge of you as an account, and the same staff you're used to dealing with are part of our new combined dedicated team of professionals. So a loyal client gets my announcement letter that says, I'm still there. I brought in an expert in your, in your industry. My staff's still there. My clients are the same, and I'm still in the same area. Why will they go to a stranger instead of staying with us? You want to learn to take advantage of that loyalty, not hide it. So it's very important, whether it's in face-to-face, -face, whether it's uh, through a, a phone call, whether it's through a letter, to send that message about the gain, not the loss, about how much more we can do for you, not how much more it's going to cost, not that I'm disappearing, not that the staff's disappearing, things of that nature. Those are some of the keys to retaining clients. Let's do our last polling question, then I'll finish up. All right, sounds good. Uh, folks, you should see the third polling question coming up in just a second here. And the question is, your most likely personal succession plan looks like find an external buyer selling internally to partners or staff or no idea. So uh, this is our third poll question. Please go ahead and select one of those three options. Click the submit button and um, that will get you eligible for CP if you filled out the previous two as well. Um, so we'll go ahead and take about 15 more seconds here for, uh, for people to go ahead and vote if they haven't done so already. All right, um, so let's go ahead and close it out in three seconds, two, one, and close. And so, Joe, we've got 43% looking to find an external buyer as their eventual succession plan, and then an even split of the rest of folks between selling internally or no idea. Okay, well, because we're just we're finishing up our time, I'm going to try and be a... 33 record on 45 and finish these last points. And if you don't know what that means, you don't have to worry about succession. Um, the last thing I always want to talk about briefly are the four C's. These are the rules of thought uh, that are, uh, rules that I use for M&A. First one is chemistry. If you don't want to eat lunch with someone, don't do a deal with them. Your clients are comfortable with you. Your staff's comfortable with you. Partners are comfortable with you. If you're not comfortable with someone else, why would they be? A firm that has to make wholesale changes that will, clients will notice is another thing to avoid. You want to have continuity. Now, if they use a different software, that's behind the closed door. That doesn't matter. But clients should be treated similarly in front of the door unless it could be improved upon. The cultures have to match, like we said, in the capacity. A good deal is a fair deal. Remember, it's a package. You can't look at anything individually. For those who were looking for some additional resources, the, uh, well, a, uh, well, let me stick with this one. The AICPA has a huge succession planning resource center, especially uh, for smaller firms. 
really, really useful information. Help yourself to it. Uh, if you're a member of the PCPS, all that information is for free. And on our website, there's a break, there's a drop down under articles. There's probably 80 articles that my partner Terry and I have written on how to value a practice, structure a deal, admit partners, what to look for in due diligence, ownership agreements. Help yourself to them. Uh, there's no sign in. There's n nothing like that. Uh, you might find some of some of the questions that you come up with to be answered there. Uh, Div, I think I've, I've abused my time already. Okay, sounds great. Um, so, Joel, I'm gonna. Uh, I know a couple of folks need to head out pretty quickly here. So, if you don't mind, I'm gonna throw a couple of questions your way here. Uh, someone asked earlier. In multiple partner firms, should one partner take the lead on investigating potential M&A candidates or should that be shared work? I, I like one person taking command of, of, of it. Um, however, that goes back to unity of partners, that before they take command, that the partner group should make a decision of what success looks like. What's the nature of the firms we're looking for? What's the goals of them? Do we have the capital to make this work? Um, do we have the capacity? So you want to come up with a plan, a detailed plan, just not randomly look what's in the marketplace and have one person be the, be the leader of it, but that person should regularly be sharing with people. What you don't want to have is one person manage the entire process, come to the end, there's an agreement in terms, due diligence works out, then there's a vote and it's not voted through. It's too much of a waste of resources. But having one person steer the ship is a very powerful way to go about it. Okay. Uh, another question was, um, do you know the average age of people who are exiting? Or I assume this means partners who are exiting. You know, there's no statistic that does that. I, I probably do more succession planning than anyone in the country. What I could tell you is that uh, m while most of them obviously are going to be between 60 and 66, I've got people that are 75 that say, give me a call in five years, I'll be ready. It's such a personal decision, but I will tell you that most larger firms have now put in mandatory retirement, uh, which most of the time is 65. I've seen, it, the, I'd say 90% of them fall into 62 to 70, but the highest percentage is 65. So you're starting to see more and more of mandatory retirement. A one, two, three partner firm rarely has it. Um, but most of them who are looking to get out are going to be between 60 and 70 years old. Uh, some younger ones get out, uh, some people never get out. So it's a personal choice. All right, and then the last question we have here, uh, does transition advisors also handle independent wealth management firms? Very, only time we help wealth management firms is if they're merging into a CPA firm. Not having 12 CPA firms that refer them work, literally looking to become a wealth management division for a CPA firm, but we don't help wealth management firms merge with each other. We're very, very niche oriented that we stay within the CPA world. We do take cybersecurity companies into, the, into them, litigation support into CPA firms, wealth management into them, but we don't help wealth management with wealth management. It's not our expertise. Okay. Great. Well, Joel, thank you so much for your time today. I know this has been very informative and uh, and people have had good questions uh, throughout this. Uh, for everybody who attended today, thanks for attending. A couple of final things I'll mention here. Our next expert webinar is in five weeks. That is on June 20th. Rick Telberg, who many of you know, CEO of CPA Trendlines, um, will be presenting 50 ways to double your income. So if doubling your income is interesting to you, you should definitely attend that webinar. If you haven't signed up for all of the expert webinars this year yet, uh, you can go to 2018webinars.com, 2018webinars.com, and you can register for all 13 remaining webinars at once, and you'll see the very impressive list of presenters that we have for the rest of the year, including, I believe, 10 more members of the Accounting Today Top 100 Most Influential list. Also, as I mentioned before, if you'd like a personalized demo of Accountants World Solutions and how they can help your firm gain profitability and relevance, please visit accountantsworld.com or you can call us at 888-999-1366. So once again, thanks to Joel for his presentation today. Thank you to all of you for your attention and, uh, and for joining us. Uh, and you'll be receiving CP certificates in about three days. Don't forget when you close out the webinar window, then you will see the post webinar survey appear at that time. Thanks again, and we'll see you shortly. 
Have a nice day, everyone.